All right, everybody. Hello there. Good evening and welcome to another presentation hosted by the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, we're starting off a new series uh, that we've been uh, we kind of focused on a, a little bit in one of our previous uh, conversations with Dr. John Willen. Um, but a series with myself and uh, Executive Director David Price of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, where we talk to uh, not only those connected with history, um, with Civil War Medicine, but also those who are practicing uh, history out in the world during the pandemic time period. Uh, so this evening we have uh, Dr. James Brumall of Shepherd University of the George Tyler Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War. Uh, and he's with us this evening. We're gonna talk a little bit about his book, um, private confederacies. We're also going to talk this evening about uh, practicing history during a pandemic, what that's like uh, for us as institutions, uh, running institutions. Um, and so I think you all are going to be in for a, for a good treat this evening. We're going to have a nice discussion. I'm uh, going to try to keep it conversational this evening um, and, and just kind of chat um, as we would be uh, doing if we were having a, a beer at the bar uh, or sitting around uh, at one of our museums after one of our presentations and just chatting. So I hope you all will enjoy this, uh, this conversation that we're going to have this evening. Uh, my name is Jake Wynn. I'm the Director of Interpretation here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I say here, I'm in my apartment in Washington, DC. David, um, down below, is at the uh, museum in, uh, in Frederick. Um, and I presume uh, Jim is uh, in his office. Um, got lots of uh, got my, lots of good books behind you. My new office, which is my my basement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just the just the new normal that we are yeah. all experiencing. Yeah. Um, so before we get in this into this evening's conversation, just want to kind of have a quick chat about what we're doing at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine uh, in terms of our digital programming. Um, we've been closed since mid-March to the public, unfortunately, uh, due to uh, COVID-19, due to the pandemic that we are all experiencing. Um, and since we've been closed to the public, uh, we have flipped over to doing online digital programming. We've been doing this uh, several times a week um, for the past uh, about a month or so, um, and have started to see uh, our audiences pick up and starting to get some momentum and more and more of you are joining out there. Thank you so much for jumping into these conversations and, and it's just adding so much to, uh, to our conversations by your questions and your comments um, and the thoughts that you all have. Um, I will say personally, I've been enjoying doing these presentations because it feels like even though I'm stuck in my 600 square foot apartment in Washington, I feel like I get to interact with all of you out there, not only uh, in this, in my city in Washington, but also uh, around the United States. And, and this is most exciting for us, around the world. Um, that is incredible. We've had um, people tuning in from uh, across Europe, from Russia. Um, it's been amazing to, to get some of that, um, some of that audience and, and have people chiming in from across uh, the globe during this, uh, during this troubling time that we are all experiencing. If you're all enjoying these programs, uh, you can support us uh, in a couple of different ways. You can uh, share this video with your friends and get them into the conversation. You can like this video, um, give us one of those thumbs up that those help share these uh, videos out to other interested people out there in the world. Uh, if you're really enjoying these programs and, and want to help the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, you can become a member. Um, we are a member supported organization uh, and your uh, membership dollars go to support programs like this and sustain us. So even though we aren't getting admissions right now and people can't come and visit, we're still providing this program, this still providing this service uh, and you can support those services by becoming a member uh, by going to civilwarmed.org um, and clicking on the support button. I'll be dropping a link into the comments in just a few minutes. Uh, you can also donate as well. Every little bit helps us. Um, David wanted me to mention, and this is just so exciting, uh, talking about our, our uh, viewership from around the world. We got a new member the other day from Norway. So um, that's just incredible to us. We're, we're getting an audience fr from around the world. Thank you all so much for tuning in this evening. Um, and go over there, drop a, drop a comment into the, uh, into the comment uh, box. Uh, let us know where you're turning in from, where you're watching this conversation from. If you have any questions uh, for myself, for David, uh, the executive director, for Dr. James Brumall, please drop it into the comments and I'll be moderating this discussion a little bit and dropping in 
uh, some of those comments into this uh, into this conversation that we're going to have this evening. Um, so thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm going to turn it over to my boss, to David Price, uh, to kick off the conversation for the evening. So David, take it away. Well, thank you, Jake. And uh, Jim, thank you for being here. Um, I, this is talking with you on Zoom is second only to running into you at the boathouse in Bethany Beach. So, and it's a, you know, <laughs> boathouse. I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Um, but I greatly appreciate it. You know, you and I have such great conversations. You know, you're at, at Shepherd University and also the George Tyler Moore uh, Center. Um, so you kind of wear two hats and, mm -hmm. you know, I just know from the fact that, you know, we're now getting members from Norway, like Jake mentioned and all across uh, the world, really. It's, um, I mean, it was a tough thing for us to close in mid March and, you know, panic set in, uh, for, for a few moments, but it seems like, you know, we immediately pivoted in our organization to, really taking a two-year initiative of online presence and shrinking it down and trying to get it going in two days. And I know you had to experience that with your institutions. So, uh, you know, with, with us, we've just really focused on any program being in this format. And so once we got the hang of it, um, you know, we've been able to con consistently do it. I can't imagine what it would be like to have to convert your classroom setting and then, you know, talk about George Tyler Moore as well, what, what you're doing there. Sure. Um, well, first off, thank you all. Um, David actually came to the open house I had when I first started at the center. So he's been a very kind and generous supporter uh, for years now. And I was very happy to meet Jake along the way, who has been a hiking companion as well as an intellectual companion all these years. And so um, thank you both very much. I've been enjoying your programming immensely. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's, I'll, I'll keep it brief, but on the one hand, yes. So we went to an online format at Shepherd University, like all colleges and universities across the country very quickly. We had a protracted spring break and the students have proven themselves to be very adaptive. I've taught online before, many of my colleagues have. So in some ways it wasn't that difficult of a transition, but under the circumstances with mental health issues and just trying to, to balance, uh, work, life, family obligations for our students and for our faculty, that part has been very difficult. Um, so everyone's trying to be very flexible and understanding and our semester is, is going to wrap up uh, before the beginning of May and the students have been very kind and generous and, and interested and engaging and we're, we're doing the best we can. The center itself is it's a little more difficult. I mean, like you, we have a physical structure, brick and mortar, and so we're primarily a research facility. We do have an, a small artifact collection, but we have visitation. I mean, we have weekly visit, visitors who come through who are in town looking at historic sites. And so that of course has ceased entirely and it will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. But there is an opportunity that's been created in the midst of this incredibly unfortunate situation. And, and that is that we, we have remarkably um, forged in this new direction and by so doing, um, really come into contact with a, a, an incredibly diverse range of audiences. And so I think yeah. we're experiencing the same sort of phenomenon that you are as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's been quite exciting. I've been, enjoyed conversing with all sorts of different people. Um, and this platform has allowed that. Typically we run a series of traditional lecture programs throughout the year, brown bags, student presentations, and a yearly seminar. Um, we started supplementing with some online programming last year, doing some live streams from the battlefields during anniversaries, but um, we were sort of slowly edging in that direction. And, and this has obviously caused us to, to move much more quickly. And I think what's been so remarkable is people like you um, have reached out. It hasn't been actually very difficult to do programming because yeah. of the generosity of all of our mutual colleagues and friends. I mean, it's, it's, it's a simply the matter of a text, a Zoom conversation, a phone call, and people are like, what can we do? What programs do you want to see happen? And we've started realizing um, in the past weeks and then moving at least two months into the future, a whole host of different programs, different time periods, different topics. And it, it has been exciting while still understanding that people are experiencing a lot of duress. You know, I mean, I, I'm quite fortunate in my position that I can work from home and that we are able through our technology to do this. Um, but also being cognizant of many people who aren't. Are you, are you finding that your stories have changed? Like 
we made a conscious effort. I mean, amongst our staff, um, you know, th those are some of the best conversations. And, and for forever before this happened, we were always, you know, talking about the experience of Civil War medicine in particular, and, and, and we saw it as a hopeful story. And we were constantly trying to draw the line between the past and the present. And I'll be honest, I think before this happened, that was a harder sell than it is now. I think now people are just in this, including myself, in this whole new realm of you're just looking for some sort of foundation. And um, we've really um, been able to not, not reinvent our story, but reorient our story to today's headlines and, and really get an audience that we didn't have before or a connection. It, we didn't have to sell the connection. Are you finding that or tweaking your story at all? Yeah, and I'll answer it broadly first. I think what's so exciting right now is that the humanities is enjoying an incredible renaissance. And, and people are now turning to books and to art and to literature and to historians in ways that they had certainly in the past, but, but now um, in, in just greater numbers. And so there is this relevancy that I think people see. I would also say at the very outset of this, this you know, I guess what we could call a crisis, I was listening to a New York Times uh, reporter and, and he couched this in the 1918 Spanish influenza. And, and Jake, of course, has talked about this on um, uh, Pennsylvania Civil War and, and winning history. And um, it, it, people started immediately looking for historical precedent. You know, how do societies respond to these situations? What happens? And in, in once this is over, what happens economically? And again, I was just listening to um, a podcast today by the New York Times and, and the reporter was looking uh, at the period between the 1920s and the 1950s, looking for historical precedent to understand potentially what could happen economically um, after uh, a pandemic or, or you know, a catastrophic war in the case of World War II. And, and so th th these instances are very tailor-made. We ourselves specifically, yes. Um, so tomorrow we're going to do a program looking at the influenza epidemic in Jefferson County, West Virginia, where we're housed. Um, some of the Facebook posts that I've done or my uh, assist, uh, assistant Catherine has done interface with ideas of civil war quarantines, civil war epidemics, civil war disease. Um, so I, I, I think there is this important relevancy to the past. And I think there's, you know, I hate to use the word lessons, but I think there are these tangible lessons that, that we can see. And I well, think- people, I mean, why not use the word lesson? I mean, I'm, I'm tired of people forgetting history and not learning from it. <laughs> I don't want to make it too banal, I guess. Um, yeah. But but yeah, no, I, I maybe mean, that is the right word. Maybe lesson is the insights. right Insights. How about we say insights? There are many insights. insights sure. Thank you, David. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I, I think some people did take it very seriously very early on because it was eerily similar to what happened in 1918 in, in, in this early phase, the way it was spraying so quickly, the uncertainty, um, and, and the potential catastrophic impact. And without people taking that very seriously very early on, things could look very, very different on the landscape right now. Now that's a lot of science and medicine, of course, but I think history at least offered some insights there and some warnings there that, yeah. that people heeded. So, well, and, and like you just said, it, it changes society and, and, and there's individual stories. It's like almost a, I mean, so many layers to it. Um, but I, I can't remember a time, I mean, when literally there was a shift in society. And when we're telling our stories here in the museum, you know, we, we talk about the Civil War in the context of medicine. So that gives us a lot of leeway because you're talking about physical wounds but you're also talking about mental wounds. So as we're progressing through this, one of the things that was really striking to me today, um, and this is where we're gonna lead into your book, which is right there, and we sell it at the museum. Um, it's, it's a really in-depth study of, well, I mean, you can explain it better, but for me reading it, it was an in-depth study of uh, diaries and journals of the written word from these people who were experiencing it. And it's on the Confederate side, which is the most rare. I mean, you know, we've got a ton of union records, but once you can uh, find these primary sources from Confederate folks, um, it, to me, it's just like, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really um, uh, the good stuff. So as I'm reading that, these guys are communicating in the written word 
and there is a delay. So there's no, uh, you know, this, there's no texting and there's no emailing and things like that. So there's a little bit of time delay and I'm watching on CNN and all the other news outlets, um, these healthcare diaries of the workers on the front line. And, and it's intense, man. And legitimately so because they're experiencing it in real time and then they're immediately turning around and recording it. So it fascinates me the way experiences are being recorded today versus what you had to do in order to um, bring their experiences to light. You know, t talk about that a little bit. I mean, with these Confederate guys and soldiers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think more broadly first, I mean, what is coming out right now, the, the oral histories um, are incredibly visceral and incredibly moving and emotive and, and you know, in some instances it's very difficult to, to hear. Um, that's because they're, as you said, they're, they're at, at that moment, they're able to e express themselves as, as, as best as possible under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. I was very careful in, in my research to look primarily at letters and diaries that were written as close to the fact as possible. So a soldier obviously wasn't taking pen to paper as he was being fired upon in the field of battle, although I do have one letter where the soldier was being fired upon and it's a fascinating letter which I can talk about, um, but they were writing very shortly after the fact. The important thing though that I have to say to frame everything is Civil War soldiers filtered their content. Now I would say that in many instances it became more and more transparent and authentic as they became more and more concerned about dying, um, either in, in a field hospital, in a camp, or on a battlefield. And so I think they really needed that authenticity because they realized how fleeting life, life, life could be. That said, they still carefully filtered themselves, especially the middle and upper classes. Now, there are those few soldiers in my study sample, Pete Carmichael, um, who you had at your museum and you have his book as well, um, talks about more fully in the War for the Common Soldier who are transitionally literate, um, or in some cases like John Fudge were probably illiterate and had someone writing for them. They yeah. tend to be a little more unvarnished. They're not schooled in the etiquette of the period. Um, so I will say there is this, this mediated reality that soldiers are creating at most levels. Now that said, and, and here's me what you're getting to David, when the emergency of war does hit, when soldiers start to see their comrades perish around them, see men anguish and de deeply anguished in field hospitals and dying horrible, unexpected deaths, they become pretty vis visceral themselves in their letters home. And, and there are countless letters in which they're, they're basically, if the sibling hasn't enlisted yet, they're saying, please don't. Please, please don't come to war. What we're seeing is horrific or telling their parents, you can never understand what we have seen or experienced or felt. And I have this one letter from the Peninsula Campaign in 1862 of a Confederate North Carolinian, a Confederate soldier North Carolinian who is writing under fire. And it's in this hasty scrawl. He's, he's writing in bigger letters. He's almost going off the page. And just the fear that he's expressing is just, you know, it's, 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 it's hard. And it, you know, it's interesting in the archives as historians, we're supposed to kind of keep this, um, this distance from our source materials and this veneer of objectivity. And I think, you know, in many ways, source materials can really move you if you listen to them and, and, you know, yeah. let it be said, and this, this should be said, you know, the, the people I study are, are white slaveholders by and large. Um, you know, there's, there, the, the that's a very difficult reality for me to understand and um, certainly something I don't sympathize with. Right. Um, and, and, and so there, you know, I kind of have to shake myself back um, into to reality at points, understanding what they were fighting for, but at a humanistic level, North or South civilian enslaved, you know, I, I've, the book has one study sample, but I've, I've read a host of these different types of layers for different projects. These sources can really move you. And I, I think there's just a, this incredible authenticity, um, especially under the circumstances under which many of these men, women, and, and, and children labored and, and, and what they endured. And you do see that, I think, to some extent, to some of the modern content they were talking about. Same is true for some of the war materials. Restrapo is one of the most powerful documentaries I've ever seen. And, you know, as two, uh, two reporters, one of whom was later killed, who embedded themselves with the units. And it's just, it's, it's horrible stuff. And they're, they're talking to these soldiers almost immediately after the fact. Many veterans who I know will not watch Restrapo. 
that it's, it's too close, too yeah. visceral. They want, yeah. You know, and these are, are many men who I think, um, you know, maintained a, a distance in, in veteranhood from their wartime experiences, but that was just too raw, too real, you know, too realistic because it was actually happening, of course. Yeah. Well, what I liked about uh, your book was that it was a human experience. Uh, so, in a way, hopefully you can read it and we avoid those kind of conflicts. You know, um, these, right. I mean, it was, these guys were wrong, but they still went to battle and, you know, and experienced death and, and, and were trying to kill people. And I, I was struck by, um, you know, I, I think of those pictures of the reunions afterwards of the unions and the Confederates where they wanted to meet the guy that was at the battle and might've shot them, not for revenge, because they just wanted to have closure to the experience. And it, you know, that, that struck me. And also um, you mentioned uh, about, they were writing through a filter. Um, I think it's fascinating the filter people are writing on social media. I mean, it's, it's their own personal filter rather than a societal filter. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. So um, let me go in reverse order here and we'll get, we'll get back around. Um, so what's interesting is during the wartime era itself, there are countless instances where uh, the battle has moved on and men are straggling on the field. And, you know, there's a wounded soldier who they were aiming at, shooting at, trying to kill five minutes earlier, they give their canteen to. It, it's just, it's, it's almost incomprehensible for us to understand, but it, it does also- even, even today at a rally, that would be, how, you know, <laughs> that just yeah. wouldn't happen. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to understand. In the post-war era, I think we have to be careful. Um, so, you know, and I, I love Ken Burns's The Civil War. I think it's a powerful documentary. I, I watch it a lot to my wife's chagrin and my children's chagrin. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in that first episode, he, he leaves us with this image of the, the reunion at Gettysburg and the blue and the gray shaking hands over the stone wall for Pickett's charge. And then we sort of say, ah, okay, America has reunited. It was a progress driven narrative. Thank goodness. And I think what we miss when we see that is, of course, not only were some of these reunions incredibly contentious, and, and Carrie Janey talks about that in, in her recent work, um, but the, the narrative itself, too, was a lot about reconciliation and healing, but at the expense of any sort of meaningful discussion of race, any sort of meaningful discussion of, of resolving these, these fundamental issues that um, we made some progress toward with Reconstruction or, and, and are then undone in, in the Jim Crow era and beyond. And, and, and so, you know, this public narrative of, of reconciliation reunion is on the one hand true, but we have to ask ourselves at what price? I think on the more micro level, what we also see is that there are lots and lots of soldiers who are still really angry at yeah. one another. And we actually see this in the material culture and in, in, and in the landscapes. And so the, all the national cemeteries that are constructed during the wartime in the post-war era, union dead only. That was a, a very specific deliberate decision that was made by the federal government, um, by, by, by soldiers themselves. That was their mode of remembrance. The monumentation that starts to go up at Gettysburg and to a lesser extent Shiloh and Antietam. These are all in the early phases, almost all entirely union monumentation. Now slowly the Confederate monuments will, will move in, but, but there is a very specific vision that's being shaped in this post war era, the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, in which there's still this defiance that many of these soldiers um, hold. So like I, like I say, it, it is a, a powerful image, but we have to be very careful about it. What, what's, what's actually going on below the surface and, and what else is being projected there? Yeah, you, you cover a lot of ground in the book. Uh, I mean, you cover a lot of ground and, and, and you're kind of going from the granular to the broad. Uh, consistently, and I and I greatly appreciated that, um, Jake. I think uh, you got a question you want to chime in on, but I will. I want to say two things real quick. The skeleton back there, his name is Bucky. Okay. Just you know, he's made, this is his first appearance, and also hello to Jimmy Horn. We miss you, man. So go ahead, Jake. Oh, yeah, Jimmy. Yeah. So it's actually it's actually a great question from uh, from Jimmy uh, for you, uh, Doctor Broomall. Um, we have a, 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 a ton of great questions. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just, um, come on, Jake. Come on, man. Sorry. Sorry. We've been, I feel like together. <laughs> we've been Jim. <laughs> um, we have a, we have some great questions um, from the uh, from the uh, comments here. Uh, some of them we'll get to at the uh, a little bit later on in the conversation. Um, but Jimmy's question is, uh, I, I think, a pretty good one. Um, do you see a, a parallel with soldiers' view of the true horror of war versus the Victorian romantic view of the war, uh, and then kind of comparing that um, to what frontline workers are experiencing versus people who are protesting the pandemic, um, protesting a, a kind of against some of the closures? Do, do you see any kind of comparison between those two? You know, yes. you have the, the the two kind of views of the war and yeah. of our current situation. Sure. Um, and so first, hi, hi, Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> need to need to touch base. Uh, it's good to hear from you. Thank you for the question. Um, so on the one hand, there's this this narrative that's very powerful in which um, Victorian culture emphasized the importance of suffering, and and so this is something that um, was a trial that uh, should be embraced, that could actually sort of elevate one's uh, uh, persona. It, it certainly embodied ideals of masculinity. And, and, and so there is a very strong currency um, that's, that, that, that basically applauds the suffering and, and says it's very necessary. Um, and there's a lot of evidence to support that, that narrative. Um, Francis Clark's book, uh, War Stories, talks about this in, in great detail. On, on the other hand, for, for my study sample, she looks primarily at Northerners, I look primarily at white Southerners. What I see is that the certitude that white Southern men had going into the Civil War is eroded to some extent, almost erased because of the horrors of that battlefield and because of the horrors of the battlefield experiences. And, and so whatever veneers they were supposed to maintain whatever suffering, whatever manly ideals they're supposed to embody, I think publicly they still largely did that. If you look at the um, casualty rate for the officer corps of the Army of Northern Virginia, it stands at 75%. 75% 75 of those men were either killed or wounded. That's catastrophic, but because officers in that era, unless you're at the highest ranks, are leading from the front. That's, that's what you did as a, as a, as a you know, quote unquote man. And those who shirked that responsibility, they were court-martialed. And, and they certainly didn't have any, the, the men themselves didn't have any faith in those leaders. And so those manly ideals are certainly still embodied. But like I said, in, in the letters, you start seeing a very different face to this struggle. Men talking about these blasted landscapes, talking about these bloated bodies, talking about the horror, the horrors of war and in, in, in a very striking unvarnished way. And I think it truly did haunt a lot of men. Diane Somerville's research, I know you, you've worked, well, features some of her stuff, um, certainly speaks to that. There's a suicide, uh, the suicide rate increases in the post-war era, David Silkenat documents that as well. I mean, these are people who really were deeply traumatized by that war. And I, I think what's hard to get at is, is, is them discussing it. And, and that's why, you know, the book did take a long time to do. I mean, it started as a dissertation and it was transformed into a book over almost 10 years time. And I mean, you know, I really went after these sources because I, I, I think there was a currency there. You just couldn't always get at it very easily. But then once you sort of tapped it and then you started to drill down, you found more and more men talking about this. I have men who talk about in 1866, waking up in the middle of the night with night terrors. I have men talking about in 1866, 1867 saying, you know, are you still haunted by the sights of the battlefield? We have veterans in the 1870s and 1880s creating art that doesn't push the boundaries like art did in the World War I era, but certainly is pushing the boundaries where it's really unmasking this normative Victorian culture and certainly going against the of more popular prints, which show these gallant lines of battle, uh, gallant battle lines clashing together and, and, you know, these studied uh, scenes that, that reflected nothing of the, 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 the smoke and the horror and the terror that these men experienced. Um, hey, so I, let, me, let me ask you this. What I was fascinated by was the, the story of the one gentleman who lost his brother and he wrote six different versions home. Sure. Talk, talk about that. I mean, that, so, so right now we're so used to being able to like immediately post uh, the experience and, my brother died and it was horrible. Um, but he went back and forth from those Victorian societal norms to, um, you know, cut into the chase. And, and you could, you could, as you pointed out in the book, his, his story, his perspective changed as 
time past from the actual moment. Sure. Um, so for those of you listeners who are familiar with Pete Carmichael's work and that of CWI, you'll know um, the name John Futch. And many years ago, Pete said, go down to Raleigh. Well, I was already in Raleigh. But he said, go down to the State Archive, take a look at this letter collection. So that's all I said. I, I read, I would say at this point, tens of thousands of sources easily. I was never more floored in my life when I read that collection. And it, it consists of about 60 letters Futch was most likely illiterate. Um, he had someone writing for him. And I had these letters blown up quite big and I puzzled over them for, it seems like years now. And Pete and I talked a lot about them back and forth. And, and so the specific collection you're talking about is after Charlie Futch is mortally wounded on July the 2nd, dies on July the 3rd, he's, he's hit at Culp's Hill, dragged off the field of battle by his brother, probably during that nighttime assault, the circumstances must've been horrific. Um, Charlie couldn't speak, uh, he's in the head. Uh, John was, was deeply shaken by this. He was already uncomfortable with his status as a soldier, um, but he was deeply shaken by this. He starts a series of letters as, as Lee retreats um, toward Virginia, then into Virginia. And what's interesting about these letters is they're by different hands. So one of them is most definitely by an officer, and, or I think an officer or an upper, upper class gentleman, still signed John Futch but it portrays the good death. Charlie was resigned to his fate. Charlie died next to his brother, John. Charlie is surely in a better life, in a better place now. He's in the afterlife. It, it, he, he, he was devoted to God and he was resigned to his fate. It embodies all of the ideals that um, you know, Drew Faust captures so well in this Republic of Suffering about the good death. The other letters there are by someone who's transitionally literate. So phonetic spelling, no real understanding of, of writing etiquette from the period. They start to start really stripping away all this veneer. And John starts talking about being half crazy, about being unable to eat, about suffering so badly that he's sick to his stomach. He starts talking vaguely about ideas of, I'm looking forward to finding um, the watermelons at home talking about desertion in other words. And you know what, and, and to me, when you were describing that, it sounded like, all right, that all comes out because for this guy to write a letter for him, they had to have a conversation about how he was feeling because the guy wanted to write a good letter. And, and that's what's so striking to me is that it's, it's not just, it's not John Futch's voice. It's, it's a conversation, as you said, with his messmate or his friend. Yeah. And I, and I, I conjecture that probably after a civil war battle, there were thousands of these conversations. Yeah. We just don't ever get them in most detail. Although I, there's some great, you know, glimpses here and there, but that in a bizarre sense, a person who's has so much trouble communicating communicates, I think what was an incredibly common phenomenon throughout the wartime era, because after these veterans came off the battle lines, after the exhaustion finally sort of wears off, after they've had their coffee and their food and they're starting to regroup, they must have started to really make some sort of accounting of things. Yeah. How do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of the deaths around us? How do we make sense of the suffering? How, you know, how, how do we go on? You know, this is well, and, this and, and, the end and of like anything. Driving, you know, the Victorian death was what they left home with. And then everybody's experienced this new form of death where it's hundreds of miles away from home. Yeah. And, you know, it, it strikes me not to get you off this train of, of thought because I mean, it's such a, I mean, by the book, because that section in itself is, is, is worth it. Um, but today you see death occurring where people are begging not to be alone. I think what's so horrific about the circumstances is just that. So nurses who, and doctors who are, who are incredible caretakers are facing quarantine patients. They can't administer the type of, of in, you know, intimate care. Yeah, literally hands-on care. Yeah, that's part and parcel of their identity. And so the accounts from nurses that I've heard and you heard and your viewers have heard have stressed that fact. And the other fact is that these people are dying in, in isolation at incredibly high numbers. And you know, I, I think that the studies are, are you know, being formed now, the long-term consequences of this have to be quite great, especially for individuals who have sworn this oath, have certain circumstances under which they work, 
and are facing severe shortages yeah. in the items that not only protect them, pr protect their patients, but then protect their families when they go home. So they themselves have to take them when they're on the front lines, so to speak, they might not see their families for two weeks because of the likelihood of infecting them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that distant, we're not, we're social by and large, we're social people. And so what's so frightening about this disease is it's, it's driven a wedge in that, right? Like we, we are forced to be apart. We're forced to, to consolidate into the smallest unit possible. And we can talk about how we're reaching out too. And this is one of those platforms in remarkable ways. But for these frontline workers, for people who um, are essential employees, I mean, the, the duress has got to be great. And I have a lot of friends on, on social media who are in that realm and I sort of read what they say. And yeah, it's a lot of unfiltered content, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger. And frankly, I think they have the right to express all of those emotions. Well, and I think that's a powerful means of, of venting, right? Yeah, that, and that's what I was going to say. I mean, I, I, I think that it is the healthiest thing in the world I mean, I don't know if I can put myself out there. I mean, if I was a frontline healthcare worker, I probably would be that, um, you know, I'd probably be the the guy on the diary thing, but I can't, it, it's, it's fascinating to me that I, knowing about PTSD from the Civil War, knowing that they uh, in the Civil War were going to this whole different shift in what they knew about the world that the same thing is happening now. And luckily in a weird way with Facebook and these diaries, they're able to get it out. Um, and, and it might be healthier. And at least as a society, you know, with McDonald's giving free meals now to healthcare workers and Dunkin' Donuts commercials helping people, at least we're acknowledging their experience, which I think is, is at least healthy. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you, you look at veterans over time and society's responses to veterans, they have varied greatly. Um, you know, Vietnam being the most famous or infamous example of a social rejection of, of veterans, that has profound, in, in, profound impact, profound consequences on, on the soldiers. Um, I, I think what's interesting is that that has certainly shifted in, in the more recent era and the more recent wars. Um, but, but that I think social embrace is absolutely vital to understand that you're being valued for what you're doing um, is, 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 you know, of, of critical importance. I mean, union veterans in a curious way in the post-Civil War era become almost social pariahs. You know, they're celebrated in 1865, 1866 in public culture. There's this sort of continued veneer but you know what James Martin and other scholars have documented is society gets frustrated with the amputees on the street corners, the beggars, the veterans who are alcoholics. You know, a lot of Northern society rejects them, and, and that has a lot of really interesting consequences. You know, pushes a lot of these men into soldiers' homes where they themselves succumb to different addictions. Uh, it, it's you know, it's, it's a very bizarre rejection um, for what was a, a greatly celebrated cause. Um, at least in the immediate post-Civil War era, but then they again kind of are perceived as social pariahs, especially because of the you know pension and other other asks that they're making of, of of society and the government. Just just so many levels of experience and 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 human experience. I mean, the 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 thing that strikes me about this, you know, being executive director of the Civil War Medicine Museum, um, I'm just constantly um, there's a there's a constant revelation and realization of you know, the actual experience of a person today is giving me insight into the Civil War experience and then vice versa. Um, it's almost like I'm a time jumper at this point with with what I'm experiencing intellectually and, 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 and emotionally. So I'm, I'm fascinated. So Jake, Jake, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Um, Jim, you know, I, I'm, I'm struck by, and this is a great conversation, kind of looking at the experiences we're seeing from healthcare workers today and kind of comparing it to the experiences of the traumas of the Civil War. Um, but I know uh, your book really kind of looks at, as you said, um, you know, white Southerners, and they have a very specific view of, you know, what is honorable and what is, you know, a, a proper manhood, especially in a wartime setting during this conflict. Um, I, I wonder just to, to kind of, you know, juxtaposition like the position that we're in now where people are kind of having this kind of free flowing of ideas of, of their experiences. How does that, you know, 
how does that compare and contrast with the Civil War, the white Southerner um, in the Civil War fighting in the Confederate Army? How did they express themselves and how does that compare to what we are, are experiencing now? That's a lot. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> getting heavy. Just like, um, so, so what are some of the social pressures that they're facing when they're writing their accounts? of so what they're experiencing. When you say account though, so just so we make this distinction, so you still mean the, the primary source letters and diaries, not- Primary sources, yeah. so so what they're, similar to what healthcare workers are doing today with writing their experiences, what they're, you know, out to the public. Yeah, because your book's about the Confederacy and then you had the union doing the same thing and they had certain societal pressures and, and things they were bringing to it. And now we've got today's which the filter is entirely different, but it's still there. I think in a strange sense, and this is gonna sound odd at first, um, today people say things and they know it's gonna be public and okay. even yeah. more unfiltered, that's okay. There was a fear in the Civil War era, if, you're, if your letters or diaries were published and they went public, you need to be a lot more guarded in what you said. So it's almost like this reverse, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so there were very specific letters that were written that were meant to be published in newspapers. Those letters are the most guarded, the most closed off, the most structured, the most veneered. That would be the antithesis of today, where uh, you know, if you're going to make this social media post and, and you're going to vent your frustrations and anger, I, I think almost the more vitriolic, the more raw and emotional it is, the better. And, and the expectation is it's gonna be viewed by thousands, maybe even millions of people, and that's okay. That would not so much be the case in the, you know, the Victorian era where I think people are still very concerned at some level, despite the crisis, despite the emergency of civil war, with how they were, to, how they were going to be perceived and how they would uphold and maintain 19th century notions of, of masculinity, of manliness, and this meant above all else, control. Those officers who are most censured are those who were drinking on the day of battle and unable to execute successfully their commands. Those officers that are the most censured are the ones that um, uh, uh, you know, turn face or show cowardice. Those who are unable to maintain that veneer of manlyhood. Those soldiers who are the most reviled are those who can't do that either. Because again, this is a, a free flow of communication between the battle lines and the home front. And so people on the home front are gonna be aware of a soldier's performance in battle. And, and so this public persona or um, facade is very important and I think it is is maintained. I mean, the reason why these soldiers fight in the newspapers in the 1870s and 80s and 90s about stuff that happened in 1863 is because they're still so concerned with public face. I did not misact or act inappropriately on July the 3rd, 1863, and I'll swear to the day I die, quite literally, that I acted in an honorable way or that I made the right move and you didn't. And, and so, you know, there is that tension in my work where on the one hand, I was very interested in those accounts that sort of strayed from that narrative because I thought, and again, using the word authentic maybe isn't right, but I thought there was some sort of more authenticity to those accounts, especially in the immediate post-war era where they're writing to other veterans. You know what it was like. You, you probably are feeling what I'm feeling. But on this, on, on, at the same time, they still often maintained a very clear public persona that was essential. And think about this too. Do you want your loved ones at home knowing that you're suffering, that you might die, and that this might be the last missive they're ever going to hear? And so there are countless letters in which Civil War soldiers are saying, you know what? Times have been tough, but we're okay. Everything's gonna be fine. Don't worry about us. You know, how are you faring? How are things on the home front? And so, so they're trying to you know, a lie, any sort of fears that their, their parents or their siblings might have. And, and that's a disjunction in our cultures, right? I, I don't necessarily think that we behave in those same ways. And we're in a very different society, right? We're in a post-Freudian era. You know, we understand psychoanalysis. We understand just an entirely different world. And so we still have veneers and facades, certainly. But... It, it, there's a lot of disjunctures too between these two worlds. And, and you know, 
this is where we don't part ways, David, but this is where I'm a little bit different. You know, as a historian, we are trained to be very careful when we draw those parallels between the eras. And so, you know, our job is to historicize, contextualize, put it into the right um, sort of phraseology and so understand it in that era. Are there parallels? Most clearly. Does the past, I mean, does the present inform the past? Most clearly. You know, I stumbled in different directions because of my current life, because of my current interests, because of the current scholarship, because of what I know about veterans. But at the same time that we have to be careful about sort of distinguishing these two arenas or spheres and, and always making sure that we properly historicize our, our 19th century actors and look at them in a slightly different way than we look at our 21st century or 20th century actors. Oh, well, that's, that's what makes history fascinating. And, and, I, and that is, I'll, I'll be honest, that's what separates, in my mind, that's what separates you from a lot of other historians uh, that I've been exposed to, is that you are taking that into account. And, um, you know, I, I definitely appreciate that. One of the things that struck me uh, in your book was about um, initially when the war broke out, they wanted to wear homemade uniforms mm -hmm. and then they didn't want to bother them at home. I mean, that, for whatever reason, that struck me. I, you know, there is a lot of material duress on the Southern home fronts by 1862, 1863. And, you know, in some of those remarkable instances, I had yeoman farmer families, non-slaveholders, relatively poor, and when the men were on the front lines, they started supplying their, their wives and their children with, with military goods because things were so bad on the home front that they, they were sending them extra shoes, sending them extra shirts so they can, can re-sew. But in that initial early war period, their identity is grounded in the home front. So they want to wear the clothes from home. They want to wear the, the, the garments that their loved ones stitched with their, you know, with their own hands so they have that material connection. Um, but as the war progresses and, and, and material conditions on the southern home front deteriorate so rapidly, the situation looks entirely different. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and you know, that's a, one of the things that I always, my hobby horse is material culture. Yeah. You're, you're a museum filled with artifacts. You know, I'd invite everyone, get beyond the liars and the diaries. I love them. I've, I read them, you know, at, for I can read them for hours and hours and hours for days upon end, which I've done in archives for, if you put it all together, probably for years at this point, and I love them, but go to the artifacts themselves as well. They have powerful stories to tell. Museums like yours have powerful artifacts that are contextualized in very smart ways, very compelling ways. And, and that's one of the things where this arena that we're in is incredibly exciting. And I'm a huge advocate for, for more of this online content, but I do hope at some point we can return back to these spaces like the National Museum of Civil War Medicine to go through the galleries, to have those conversations with docents, to sit and pause, not through a mediated reality of a screen and just think about what a, a hospital tent meant. You know, what's that, what does it smell like around it? A pair of boots, a pair of boots, some coins that they held, a little prayer book. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'm literally viewing this situation we're in is almost like spring training. It's, it's fascinating to me that any work we could have done prior to this pandemic um, would maybe have fallen on deaf ears, but now we have captive ears and we can tell these stories and, and, and be exposed to books like yours and, and those diaries uh, and, and put in context. And that will make one, that will make people want to come and see those pair of boots, that tent, um, where these people experience those things because of that material, real world, um, you know, object that you can see and um, almost touch. I, I think that's absolutely right. And the same is true. Um, we have lots of mutual friends and colleagues who are in the states and national park services. And, you know, I think that's true too. Yeah, those landscapes can't yeah. be recaptured in pictures. Environmental. Yep. In live streams. You gotta go to them. You know, you can't really un and, and Jake, like myself, um was a summer intern um down at Fred Spot. And you know, we I think we're we're trained to to really value the 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 places themselves as sites of importance. And so, I, you know, I think you're right. And I hope that's the projection. I think we will all continue to do this in some capacity because I think it's, the, it's a valuable educational medium. I, I, I think the content can be viewed at any time um, for the indefinite future. And that's incredibly useful. It's, a, it's, a, it's 
pretty democratic in some ways. Um, but I, I think there's also going to be a point where, you know, we do want audiences to get back to, to, to the these museums, these historic sites, and these landscapes to appreciate them in maybe new ways because well, that, of all the content that they were absorbing. Yeah, and that's a good circle back to, you know, um, we've got a bus trip plan with uh, Rob, Dr. Robert Hicks um, based on the, the Journal of a Surgeon in October. Mm -hmm. And we did a scouting trip with it, which we probably should have invited the gym. I feel bad now that we yeah, did. Man. Come on, come on, David. You would have loved it. You would have loved it. But um, in partnership with Seminary Ridge, and um, I was struck when we got to White's Ferry and these other locations, mm -hmm. um, just how powerful it was to stand there. And, um, you know, we have that at the Pry House. You have that in Shepherdstown as you're walking down the street. Um, it's the reason why little quaint towns uh, just totally on a tourism level um, uh, attract people because people want to be able to walk in the steps of history and experience things, you know, past generations of experience. And I think, I, I really think this is like spring training and that um, organizations like yours uh, and ours that are pivoting uh, to provide this content, it is really about getting visitors to come to us physically when they can. And, and so just like um, one, one quick question circling back to, you know, what's the future look like after uh, this thing is at least uh, pseudo under control. With our museum, um, we did self, we do, well, we did self, it's so hard. We did self-guided tours. People would come in, pay admission, spend as much time as they want, um, hang out, be close to people, touch things. Um, I anticipate for us, our new business model will be at least some reservation oriented where we can control the flow of people, the distancing of people. Um, I don't think tourism is going to come back very fast at all. I mean, you've got bus companies. Who's going to want to be on a bus at this point? Um, with our museum, we were already going towards a premium oriented guided tour. And that's probably, we'll probably won't do it premium. We'll probably structure ourselves to do guided tours. Are you guys at the George Tyler Moore or with your school changing the way you operate? It's, see, so, you know, my identity is, is wedded to that of Shepherd University. And so all of our decisions are always made in cooperation with um, the dean of my college as well as the provost. And all I can say is they're ongoing discussions. I mean, at this point, we're still projecting an October seminar our numbers are usually under 50, um, which will, I think going forward will be typical gatherings under 50, um, either once there's a vaccine or um, the immunity rate's really high, will we'll probably be more normative. Um, the space itself that we have, it's a relatively controlled environment. Um, there's, there's some public health issues there um, and that can be addressed and, and you know, the concerns can be mitigated, but it, it's uncertain. I, I will say this, um, we'll probably continue to some extent these type of cooperative ventures because there's a certain ease in this and a, a seamlessness that I really like. I mean, I've never been able to pull together so many different people for programs. Jake was kind enough to participate in one with um, uh, the Tattoo Historian and I sponsored in, in Civil War Trails last week. We had like seven different organizations peel from, you know, pretty far flung come together for one night and, and you know how hard that would be, how expensive that would be to do that in person. Oh, so, I know, I know. It, we're forced to do this. So, yeah, so, yeah. I, so my question is, you know, even I, I understand that you're like under the, the purvey of Shepherd, but you got, I mean, I'm relieved to hear that you're having these conversations because, you know, we have our Zoom staff meetings and I'm starting to introduce on those, you know, here's what it's going to look like when we're coming out of this. It's not going to be the same. We have to adjust. And, and, and there are exciting opportunities to that um, based on we're not going to stop doing this. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, last year, like I said, we hit the, the live streams pretty hard for the battlefield tours um, and we built a lot of content. We just sort of tapered off. I had personnel shifts. And um, once the semester starts, my focus always sort of shifts. But this is something that I do want to continue. I mean, we've just been reaching a lot more people and, and it, it's raised our footprints. 
in just incredible ways. I mean, that started to some extent uh, with just more face, more directed Facebook content, but now with more of the live stream programming and the cooperation with, with different organizations, you know, we're sort of helping each other, right? Every time we partner with someone else and we both publicize the event, we're helping each other and we're bringing in more audiences. And the hope is that we, when we do do those per, in face person to person events, that we've garnered new audiences and we've we've raised the, the profile and publicity. But I think to some extent, this type of programming won't stop. And in, what is nice is Shepherdstown is incredibly small. We have a captive audience. So when we do it, when we do a lecture on campus, we're going to draw good numbers. It's guaranteed. Right. But all we're going to draw is local people. We'll occasionally have someone who's out of state who happens to be on campus on a Thursday night. It's only for our bigger events do we get broader audiences. Um, so what's so nice about this is we can reach so many people um, and, you yeah. know, so easily and readily. And, and I, that's something that I like. And I think you just described the two levels that we're probably going to orient ourselves with is the virtual one and the local one. Because yeah. we're blessed to be in downtown Frederick where there's yeah. a ton of restaurants that hopefully will be open again. Um, but even, you know, even if that's a limited way, people are going to want to walk the streets. And um yeah, I, th I think there's opportunity there. So I want to make sure that Jake, you're able to get some questions in and uh, I know they have a bunch of them from Jim and, and again, read the book right there. Um, yeah, you can find it in the, uh, there's a link in the comments uh, if you'd like to purchase the book. Um, we do sell it at the store um, at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. So you can also buy it on your next visit to the museum whenever the heck that is going to be. Yeah, um, and please like us and subscribe to YouTube because all the content that we're doing now, um, we're putting up there so that it's up there because I'm hoping these conversations, while they include what we're experiencing today, um, will be somewhat timeless. Um, because what we're talking about here is, um, you know, uh, how, how do we continually change but still stay true to the missions of our organizations? So well, what kind of questions do you have, Jake? Yeah, um, I'll just say to, to your comment, David, that's a, where we're getting very meta here, but we are um, in a way on documenting, yeah. living, and operating a museum through this. Um, and so for future, we'll have this, you know, five, 10, 15 years from now, hopefully we'll have these videos still uh, that we'll be able to look back on and say, how did we, uh, how did the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and the George Tyler Moore Center get through the pandemic of 2020? Um, yeah, so how, did kind we, of how, a, did we, how did we end up rock and rolling so hard after this? Hey, yeah. so, so Jake, that, uh, um, you were encouraging people from your winning history, W-Y-N-N-I-N-G, uh, history blog um, for people to write their own diaries and their own journals. Um, I'm, so, are you doing that? Yeah, I'm. I'm doing that. Uh, still, still been. We actually put out a, a New York Times article on our Facebook page uh, yesterday um, that encouraged people to do that. Um, again, documenting this uh, so that we will have future sources for what it was like to live through through this moment in our own voices. If you want to live on in history, here's an opportunity um, that future historians, future researchers might look back um, at your uh, manuscript collection. Um, and, yeah, and you, well, what I was getting at kind of is that really you're doing it to help yourself deal with this, right? And your own. I journey. mean, it definitely helps. I mean, I yeah. uh, thinking thinking like, you know, I read back a month ago, I started this, I think on March 12th, I started documenting kind of every day what, what life was like um, in the pandemic. Um, and it was just as everything was starting to shut down. And I don't remember half of the things that I wrote. Right. Um, and it's a month ago, you know, yeah. so it's, it's, a, it's a great tool just to help organize your mind and also to unload some of the things that we're all experiencing. I've been having crazy dreams. I've heard this from other oh, people, but other people have been having them as well. We actually have a future program that I'm working on scheduling, talking about civil war dreams um, and the experiences oh, that they- pandemic dreams. I have some about chicken recipes, a whole bunch <laughs> So, um, but yeah, that's definitely um, encouraging people to, to, to take it seriously in terms of, you know, documenting what it's like to live um, through this moment. Um, 
but to, to transition, I, I have a good question here. And this goes back way up to the top. And unfortunately, I'm having some kind of glitch where I can't actually see the question. So I'm sorry, uh, the person who asked this question. I can't name you. Um, but uh, I do remember the gist of the question, which is, uh, Jim, as you're doing some of this uh, online programming for the George Tyler Moore Center, are you involving students in that process at all or, or have plans to in the future? Yeah, we have a program that will run in, I think, mid-May. Um, it's actually going to be an earlier topic. It's loyalism during the American Revolution. But we have a colleague of mine who's done a really interesting project uh, with Maryland loyalists. And it's, it's going to be an online digital platform. We had two students who just did a really good presentation. And so I'm going to bring them in. Um, I have a project that I'm working on uh, with a student, uh, an alumna of uh, the Civil War concentration at Shepherd, and we're gonna do an interview with her. So yes, moving forward, um, we, are going, we are going to involve students. And one of the things I do pride myself on is um, I, I, you know, I, I try to be very di diverse in my audiences that I bring on. So um, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of platforms where academics like myself appear. What I've tried to consistently do is, is reach out to public historians, some academic historians, but a lot of public historians, and um, obviously, of course, my students as well. And you know, I, I like that diversity and perspective and experience. I think it's, it's, it's very different. And um, in, in some ways, what I've hoped for some of our past programs, especially the one that you were part of last week, is that most of our students at Shepherd go on into careers in public history. So I want them to, if they are tuning in, or you know, I'm encouraging them to, <laughs> um, to, to hear from people in the field. You know. How, 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 what do you do as a small historical society with a staff of two at a time like this? You know, how, how do you start to transition your content? How do, you, how do you think about your mission statement? How do you think about your vision statement? How do you think about your future? And I, I think it's really valuable for them to sort of get these insights. Um, and that's why I do in my classroom too, not this semester, obviously, but traditionally I bring in just a lot of practitioners. I want them talking to people in the field. But yes, I promised programming um, in May that will involve um, a number of different Shepherd students, either current or um, past. And so that's certainly something that we're doing. And, and like I said, the students are holding up remarkably well. Um, I'm a little reticent to, to have anyone do anything during the semester itself right now, given their strains and the circumstances under which they operate. But I think May, things will sort of open up a bit and um, this loyalism program is gonna be good. And then I'm gonna talk to someone at Clark County Historical, uh, Melanie Garvey. So we're excited about that. Well, yeah, Mel Melanie was one of our, uh, one oh, of yeah. our <laughs> interns. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, what I was gonna point out was, you know, you, you and I, 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 I am so glad I went up. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure why I went up to Shepherd. Uh, I think it's because I had never heard of the George Tyler Moore thing. Right. Uh, but I am, that's like one of those moments in life where I'm just, you know, constantly glad I did um, because, you know, you and I were fast friends and um, uh, anybody you send us from Shepherd, we put to work. Yeah. So, um, you know, we are definitely an outlet for Shepherd students to do our blog entries, to, uh, you know, submit papers, uh, to do programs. Um, we are very interested in young historians and, you know, you guys, you in particular are the driving force in producing, um, you know, a lot of young historians that will make an impact. And I hope we can be a channel to facilitate, you know, the hard work that, that you're doing there. Um, so I, I, you know, I can't stress enough, um, how rock solid your program is, um, at the school and, uh, at the George Tyler Moore Center. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think we do work hard and um, I do not want to be prideful, but yeah, I mean, I think I am proud of what we've done and especially what my students have done. I mean, and yeah. my, my colleagues, I have really good colleagues. And what's been so remarkable about living in this area um, is it, just the community that, that we live among. It's just incredible. I mean, yeah. I've been so fortunate. Um, You're walking down the street, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it's, you know, a quick trip to Sharpsburg, Frederick, Harpers Ferry, Winchester, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, it's just this incredible area. It's just so vibrant. And we're surrounded by just incredible natural resources as well. And the historic resources is just such a nice place to be. So um, I think our students get a lot out of their educational experience here. And I know my past students who have interned at your museum have, have, have done really well. Stark Harbor, another one, he's at UNC Chapel Hill right now um, in a PhD program, one of the best PhD programs in the country for what he's doing. 
Um, Melanie is now a Clark County Historical as their archivist. And so we deeply appreciate all, all the, the help that you've given our students. So thank you. Yeah, well, we're just here for you. So Jake, do you have any other audience questions? Yeah, so we're just about out of time, but I uh, did have a question. This isn't so much for uh, for Jim as it is for uh, for myself and for David. Um, we did have multiple people in the comments who are interested in buying uh, Jim's book uh, from the museum. So if you are interested in that, please just give us a send a message to the museum on Facebook. Um, pretty easy to do. Go to our page and click uh, send a message um, and uh, we'll start the communication there um, and I'll hook you up with our store manager, Trish Flora. Uh, and they're autographed. They are autographed. <laughs> so you get an autographed copy uh, and that way you can support the museum as well. Um, and I'll connect you with our store manager, Trish Flora, to, to, to give the details about that. So, um, yeah. And there was one, though, uh, I saw one question come through if, if you can order stuff online. And yes, you can. By the way that uh, Jake described it, you know, we recently went through a rebranding and we're developing a ton of new um, products uh, that we have in stock and we're going to set up an online store but in the meantime you can you can facilitate that through through uh, the Facebook messages or emails so yep all right so uh, we've been going a little over an hour now so gonna drop uh, gonna drop off for the evening but I want to thank all of you out there for for watching and, and hanging out with us for an evening and having this conversation uh, throwing in your comments and questions. Uh, we really appreciate all of the support. If you are enjoying these videos, please consider uh, donating to the museum, becoming a member that helps to support these programs and keep these programs going. Um, it also helps to uh, you know, ensure that in this time of no admissions to the museum that, that we can continue uh, our operations. So we're really appreciative of all of you out there who have already donated. Uh, who have become members. Uh, we've seen a, a major jump in membership over the last couple of weeks, which is really exciting. So thank you all so much for the support. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and other ways you can do it, you can go ahead and even at the end of this video, you can like the video, you can share the video. Uh, this video stays on our Facebook page. Uh, and as David mentioned earlier, it will be on YouTube. Um, in the next couple of days as well. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel to get even more content uh, from several years um, uh, of, of time. Um, so those are ways that you can support us. Uh, but this is Jake Wynn, Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of, Signing, uh, of National Museum of Civil War Medicine, signing off with my boss, David Price, Executive Director of the museum, and Dr. James Brumall of the George Tyler Moore Center uh, for the Study of the Civil War. Thank yeah. you all so much for tuning in, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you all so much. Take care and be healthy. Stay well. Thank you, Jim.